You're listening to Dr. Karen, Love and Life, right now. I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril, psychologist, author, speaker, former, former professor, professor, and musician. The total package. Learn how to have true intimacy. Drag down, knock out fights, and then have like really hot makeup sex, right? I'm all about living authentically and finding the best version of you and living life to its fullest. Don't stop that play button. Get connected. You know, marriage is great, but only if it's a great marriage. You know, fear can't live without thoughts to support it. Got the passion? Channel your path to a more authentic you. Living an authentic life. Listen to Dr. Karen right now on Love & Life. Welcome to Dr. Karen Love & Life. Hi there. I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. I'm a psychologist, author, speaker, former professor, and musician. You might know me from my latest book, Single is the new black. Don't wear white till it's right. I'm here on my new podcast. We'll be talking about living and relating authentically in all realms of life. We'll look at how to have true intimacy in romantic relationships, more meaningful friendships, healthier family connections, more productive and fulfilling careers, and learn methods for staying happy, hopeful, and positive all while channeling a path to a more authentic you, living an authentic life. So for my first podcast in February, the month of love, I want to title the series. We're going to be talking about love throughout the month. And I want to title the series, The Love is Real. Because I want to take back a term that has a little bit of a negative connotation People talk about the struggle being real, and that's not to minimize that struggles can be real. But I like to take sometimes um, a term or a saying that has a negative or pejorative association, and I like to bring it back to the positive, because as you guys know, thoughts are powerful. And so I want to talk about the love being real, because especially during this time, with the political realities that are going on and Friends from very different vantage points feeling a lot of fear, which we talked about last podcast episode, how to manage fear, how to not operate from a place of fear. But there's a lot of fear going around. And I want to remind us all that the struggle is out there, of course, but the love is also very real. And the people I interact with, I really see us as having a lot more in common than we have differences. And so I want to just have an overarching theme For the next month, it's consistent with Dr. Karen Love and Life anyway, because I want to talk about love and life. So we're going to focus on love, and we're going to make it the Love is Real February. And as part of that, I want to introduce the love of my life, hashtag the one. He's kind of referred to by some people as the one, because that's how they know him from my book. But um, yeah, so I'm going to have my husband jump on a little bit throughout the episode. You want to say hi? Hi, babe. (laughs) Hi, hi audience. (laughs) So thank you, darling, for joining me. No, it's a pleasure. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple different things, and then we'll get the guy's perspective. That's something else for my book. For those of you who've read it, uh, every chapter I have guy talk, where we get a guy's opinion about the theme of of the chapter. And so that's kind of what we'll do here today. Thanks again, sweetie. I'll talk to you in just a minute. Sounds good. We're going to talk about romantic love, of course, friendship, and the love amongst friends. And we're going to talk about family love, too. My dissertation was on individuation from family of origin and identity development. And so I look a lot at adult family functioning and look at adult relationships and specifically family relationships. And there's a lot of misconception And I think a lot of us carry around unrealistic and actually unhealthy expectations with family relationships. And so I think looking at love within families will be really interesting. And I think you might be surprised by some of what the research tells us. You're listening to Dr. Karen Anderson Abril on Love & Life. Go to our website, drkarin dot me. That's www.drkarin.me. Karen with a K dot me. Have any questions or would like to share your story with Dr. Karen? Email her Karen K A R I N at dr Karen dot me. So 
speaking of research, I want to talk about a theory of love that's based in psych research by a psychologist named Dr. Robert Sternberg. And he looks at love and tries to break it down. You know, in psych, we do a lot of trying to take these nebulous concepts and these nebulous feelings or emotions or human conditions that we all experience and try to concretize them by making them more tangible, making them something that we can study and analyze and break down. And even we call it an operational definition. So trying to get something that like love that just feels very kind of out there and kind of hard to really bring home to study. But that's what psychologists do is try to take these constructs and these nebulous concepts and make them more concrete. Uh, he's created a very interesting model for love. And I love it. I think it's really helpful. It's something that once you hear it, you'll be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But it's a nice model to kind of tuck away and help you kind of understand and analyze your love relationships in a more clear way based on viewing them through Dr. Sternberg's model. So he calls his theory the triangular theory of love. And like I said, it's a pretty simple construct that tries to capture the essence of love relationships. Even further, it kind of really identifies what most of us are looking for when we're looking for love, which again is a great theme to touch on during February. And as I explained Sternberg's theory, you may want to think about your significant other or someone you've been in a relationship with in the past and kind of analyze what was working in this past relationship or the current relationship and what wasn't working based on Sternberg's model. And he breaks love down into three components. The first one is passion. So physical chemistry, sexual attraction, excitement. The second facet of love is intimacy. And here he's talking about closeness, feeling attached to someone, having respect for that person, holding each other in high regard. And then the third facet is commitment. And that's obviously just like it sounds. It's that decision to stay together. And what's interesting is that Dr. Sternberg breaks down the different configurations we could have based on the varying levels of each of these facets. So the different configurations we might have in a particular relationship based on how much of passion, intimacy, and commitment is involved in this particular relationship. So let's take a look at it and look at, the, again, the different uh, configurations we could have. So we could have passion only, right? And that could just be this intense attraction to one another, this intense chemistry, and you're totally hot for each other. And Sternberg says if you have a relationship with just passion, it's essentially infatuation. And so many relationships can start with just passion, and that's all they have. It's that kind of love at first sight or you walk into a, a party and you see someone across the room and it's just like your heart starts going and you're just like butterflies and and zaza zoo and it's there and it's magical and it's happening. But if that relationship remains just passionate without intimacy or commitment, then it's going to stay, according to Sternberg, it's just going to stay as infatuation. You could also have intimacy. And many of your friendships are just intimate relationships where you like each other, you have that high regard, we feel attached to our friends, and we feel very close to them, but there's really no set commitment to our relationship, nor is there any sexual energy with our friends. Sternberg also says we could have what he calls empty love, and that would be where there's nothing to the relationship except commitment. That could be a relationship, maybe a marriage that has just really died. And so the couple stays together because of the kids or stays together just out of obligation, but there's really no passion left, nor is there any even friendship left. They really kind of live separate lives and have a completely different uh, desires for the relationship. And so really the only thing holding them together is the commitment. Hi, I'm Joey. I'm from Pompton Lakes, New Jersey, and I listen to Dr. Karen, Love and Life. Now, Sternberg also says we could have, for example, passion and intimacy, and that's what he calls romantic love. So that's when, again, in the beginning of a relationship, as you have that initial attraction, that, that sexual chemistry and that intensity and then also as you grow to really like each other and to build that friendship component of your relationship Sternberg considers that romantic love 
And so you have that in the early stages of relationship, but you haven't yet committed to each other in any way, shape, or form. And so that would be romantic love, according to Sternberg. He also talks about if you have intimacy and commitment, he calls this companionate love. And this would be, again, a relationship where you have the friendship, you're very, very close, you really respect each other and admire each other, and you're committed to each other, but the passion's not there. So again, that could be a relationship well, honestly, the relationship I had with my ex fiance. For those of you who know my backstory or have listened to the podcast, I really held my ex fiance in very high regard. I cared very deeply for him. We were committed to each other when we got engaged, but the passion that, as I always say, I borrow from Sex in the City, the Zaza Zoo, just wasn't there. And so the relationship was going along based on the commitment and the fact that we really were really great friends. But because we didn't have that intensity, the passion wasn't there. The companionate love, at least for me, wasn't enough to go the distance. You could also have what Sternberg calls fatuous love, which is silly and pointless love to his mind, which is passion and commitment. But I think it's kind of funny you think about like those couples who have that intense sexual energy for each other, and maybe they just get in these huge fights because they really don't like each other because the friendship aspect is missing from their relationship. But they have like wicked drag down, knockout fights and then have like really hot makeup sex, right? Because they've got what Sternberg would call fatuous love. So they've got the passion. They're committed to each other because they probably, for whatever reason, really kind of like it. <laughs> they like this drama that they're involved in, but they don't have the friendship. They really don't like each other. And then Sternberg talks about consummate love which is when we have all three facets of his model at work in the relationship. When we have the passion, the commitment, and the intimacy. And it's really, according to Sternberg's theory, it's really what most of us are striving for when we're looking for love. It's that that model of like the perfect couple, right? They're best friends. They have really hot attraction for each other, hot sex, and they're really passionate for each other. And they have that that commitment too. He's thinking about a couple that like even 15 years on in their relationship, they're still like really having a great time in the sack. And they, they really can't imagine themselves any happier with anyone else than they are with each other. And Sternberg also asserts that this is probably even easier to find than it is to maintain. And I think that's something we can look at in in future podcast episodes as well, looking at how do we maintain if we are lucky enough to find it. And I would actually submit it's not that easy to find. It certainly took me a long time to find it. Um, it, I don't think it's that easy to find, but I think it's one of the reasons that we're struggling now trying to fall in love. The singles that I talk to, the people that are in relationships, we are looking for something, you know, we call it the total package. We're not ready to settle. We're not willing to take anything that's less than. And I, as you guys know, I'm all for it. I don't think we should be settling, especially when it comes to love. And I don't want us to compromise on this most important relationship in our lives. I don't think we should compromise and take a a relationship that just has intimacy and commitment because, you know, that companionate love, then you might as well just be friends with someone. When you're talking your your life partner, I think you should shoot for the stars because life is long and life is hard and you are going to face challenges. And I think back again, connecting to my own experience, I think about if I tried to go the distance with my ex-fiance, we wouldn't have because that passion that was missing, that's the piece that keeps you glued together when the going gets tough. And so Sternberg argues that it is hard to maintain consummate love, even if you find it. And I argue it's even hard to find it in the first place. But once you do, how do you keep it going? How do you maintain it? How do you nurture it? How do you cultivate it? And what I love about psych theory in general, and obviously I'm a psych nerd, but what I love about it is that when we have, again, a model like this is helpful to us because when we look at it, we can kind of then be more objective about our own relationship because love like I said earlier it's nebulous it's hard to define but with a definition like Sternberg has provided us with now we can look at it and go okay I'm not feeling 100% satisfied in my relationship well is it the case that one of these facets that Sternberg describes one of these facets isn't being nurtured enough like for example a couple might go you know there's something not going well in our marriage 
Well, is it that we just need to make sure that we just kick up the passion in the bedroom? I mean, of course, that could be a, a, a part of your relationship that because of the busy schedules and, and crazy lives that we lead, that you might be not paying enough attention to your sex life. Or it could be your friendship. And I, you know, I'm all about maintaining a strong sense of yourself within your relationships. I mean, that's so important. I mean, and having your time with your friends apart from your partner, I think is really healthy in a relationship. But at the same time, if you're not devoting to your spouse, the same kind of energy that you're giving to your girlfriends or to your guy friends, if you're not giving that same friendship element to your spouse, that's again, a place where your relationship might be deteriorating. And you're not even aware that it's going downhill, but you just feel like something's amiss. Or again, the commitment. Do you need to renew your vows? I mean, who knows what it might be for your particular relationship. But again, this model is a real nice way to kind of unpack and examine what's going on in your relationship so that you can try to bolster it in whatever area it needs some more attention. So as promised, I'm going to bring in my husband, Dan, to give us the male perspective on all this love stuff. Hi, darling. Hi, sweetie. So I love this model that Sternberg came up with because I think it really helps us understand why true love or the total package or whatever you want to call it can be hard to find. And sometimes you got to wait a while to find it because you are asking a lot of one person, aren't you? You are. Be my best friend. Be committed to me, someone I can trust. And also, you know, I want some magic between the sheets. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Soulmate stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that it helps us understand too, like a modern dater compared to those who were dating, like in our parents' age, even our grandparents' age, certainly the expectation wasn't the same. I think in days gone by, there would have been, hey, he'll be a good provider and he's loyal and faithful so that maybe that friendship was there and the commitment was there and he'll be a good husband and um, a good uh, father. Maybe that was enough. And you'd hope that the magic would happen eventually, but Maybe, maybe not, but, but women were vulnerable and they needed that financial security that a man could provide. And so sometimes they probably couldn't hold out for maybe the fairy tale. Right, right. That uh, expectation was probably tempered a little bit just because of society and, and maybe where people lived and, and, uh, and maybe limits on travel. And, it, you know, it seems now that we can, everyone can go anywhere they want to. And so they don't necessarily have to marry their high school sweetheart or, you know, the captain of the football team or, um, you know, someone that's on their own block or in their town, you know, they can move on and and see the world a little bit and learn more about themselves. Their expectations go a little higher and and their their network spreads a little bit. Well, yeah. And they've always got another pool of eligibles on their phone. One swipe away. Oh, now. Now. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. It's a new dynamic. It surely is. Um, But yeah, I think it helps us understand why we want really extraordinary connection. And I, for one, you know, over my 27 years of dating, there were times when I doubted, is the total package real? Is this just some, you know, Disney princess movie that I'm like at 35 still clinging to, hoping that my Prince Charming's out there. And so I like the model because it shows that, you know, you're not alone in wanting that, that really comprehensive connection to someone on all those levels. And also that we can, I I think, you know, you and I've talked about it. You can find that, but it may take some time and it would be unreasonable to expect that kind of intensity with every person you go on a date with. So I think sometimes when, when daters get frustrated and they're like, oh, why doesn't this work? I'm thinking, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with that person. It's just not a fit. It's just not that kind of energy between you. Right. When I think too, um, there's a little caution sometimes, you know, it, people get a little wiser as they're in more relationships. And mm-hmm. so they tend to, to not jump with both feet in and, and yeah. which, which is probably a good thing, right? Yeah, I was and, like that when we first started dating. And, you yeah. know, I, I'd been on the scene a long, long time. And so I was maybe even more jaded than I realized, not trying to be closed off, but, but it kind of took me a little bit. Well, and when, when I was 46 and divorced and, and suddenly back out there, mm-hmm. you know, I wasn't, I wasn't 100% sure. I was hopeful, but I wasn't 100% sure that, that I would be able to find, in my eyes, a beautiful woman who was also, you know, just as beautiful on the inside. And so uh, obviously... I found that and I'm so thankful for that. But, you know, it's easy to to get in your head and and, and think that's maybe not there. And and so um, good to be patient and and picky, certainly. 
Yeah, and I think the the thing to hold on to is the, is the the luxury that we have now as we're taking our time to get to know ourselves and be individuals and be very sure of our own identity before we try to become intimate with someone to go the distance. That okay, so maybe we take longer to find the one, but that's okay because we're very happy and hopeful and positive in and of ourselves. We're we're good single, and, and so. Take all the time you want. I mean, and as my listeners know, I, I encourage everyone, take as much time as you need. Because, you know, I, one of my quotes I like to say is, you know, marriage is great, but only if it's a great marriage. marriage right. A cruddy marriage, just to be married, is not great. And, and, and marriage has been the most profound thing that's ever happened to me is marrying you. Thanks, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's very sweet of you. <laughs> but, but it wouldn't be anything unless it was extraordinary. I get, and I guess what I'm trying to get at is to encourage my listeners that, you know, it is possible. Hang in there. Stay positive and believe because if, if you want that really extraordinary connection and extraordinary relationship, it may take some time, but it's totally worth it. Yep. You just may very well find the love of your life. So, yeah. So this model is, I think, really a powerful one that's pretty simple to wrap your mind around but can be really profound when you're trying to understand your love life better and what you're going for. And and for example, when I came across it, it helped me understand when I finally allowed myself to look at it, why my ex-fiance and I weren't firing on all cylinders. And it helped me understand why I needed to get out of that relationship and, and free him up to find consummate love himself and free me up to find consummate love. And so I want to mention that I was doing a little research just to kind of refresh on this theory. And I found an online test that you can take to see whether your relationship is being nurtured in all three elements of Sternberg's theory. So I'll throw a link to that on my website so that you can test your own relationship and and see if it's uh, able to go the distance based on Sternberg's theory. Hi, I'm Madison, and I listen to Dr. Karen's Love and Life in Cary, North Carolina. You can find me at my website, www.drkaren.me, and that's Karen with an I. On Twitter, I'm at Dr. Karen Anderson. Facebook, Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Instagram, Dr. Karen. And I'd love to hear from you. You can email me your story. I'm at Karen, K A R I N, at drkaren.me. Please go to iTunes and subscribe. I'm also on Stitcher, Spreaker, and SoundCloud at Dr. Karen Love and Life. So another theory of love that has been really helpful to many, many, many people I've talked to as they're trying to navigate their way through relationships, and especially when they're trying to better understand their partner, and when there's at times a disconnect, when you truly love each other, but for some reason you're not being able to really meet each other's needs and you're really not sure why. It's a brilliant but simple model by a psychologist named Dr. Gary Chapman and it's called the five love languages. And I'll be honest with you, when I first came across it, I kind of thought, gosh, that's so basic. It's so obvious. And then one of my very, very good friends, one of my best friends, went through some problems in her marriage and she read the book based on the counselor they were seeing and she was like, Karen, this book saved my marriage. And I was like, those love languages? I mean, they're okay. I think it's interesting, but I mean, it saved a marriage? And she was like, yeah, you know, here's the thing. They are basic, but you know, so often the most profoundly impactful things in our lives are not necessarily rocket science, right? I mean, sometimes it's the, it's the smallest changes that can have the hugest impact. And so I want to break down just a little bit the five love languages. So once she had told me how powerful it was, I started giving it a little bit more credit. And again, apologies to Dr. Gary Chapman, because he was right all along. I was the one who was wrong by minimizing the power of the love languages. But by the time I met Dan, I was already on board with the love languages. And so early on in our relationship, just for fun, we took the quiz. I had the book and I was reading it and I, um, there's a quiz in the back. And again, this is another one. The quiz is online. So I'll put that link up on my website too, so that you guys can take it so that you can better understand the love languages. And let me break it down a little bit so you understand what's going on with them. So the love language concept is one where Our default mode, our expectation is that other people want to receive love the way that we want to receive love. But here's the deal. Other people don't necessarily want to receive love the way 
that you want to receive love. And that's the one problem is because it's a wonderful thing to assume, hey, everyone's like me, right? Or do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the golden rule is a wonderful rule. I'm, I'm not trying to dismiss it, nor is Dr. Gary Chapman trying to dismiss it. But in love, we need to be a little bit more nuanced than just to assume that if I like a particular way of being loved, the people I want to love want that same language is how Dr. Chapman calls it. So let me just give you the five love languages that Chapman came up with. So number one is gift giving. Two is quality time. Three is words of affirmation. Four is acts of service. And five is physical touch. So these are the five main areas where we can express love. And like I've been saying, we oftentimes just by default, we want to express love, assuming that whoever we're trying to express love to wants to receive love the same way that we would. And so it's really helpful. And again, like I said, it it can save a marriage uh, if you understand your own preferred love languages and then understand your partner's preferred love languages. And thinking about ways to kind of amp up your love life or amp up your relationship or maybe if you're unsure of what's going on in a relationship, why there's something feels amiss, looking at these two models could be really, really helpful. So let's talk about gift giving just a little bit. So sometimes people love to get gifts. I mean, who doesn't like a present? Of course we do to a degree. And, and, and Chapman's saying everyone loves all of these, but it's how – what but but we have priorities in our lives and we value different love languages differently. So maybe you like to give gifts and receive gifts, but it's not number one. Maybe you're more into quality time. That's more meaningful to you when someone takes time out of their busy day in our crazy lives to actually devote time to you. That's more powerful for you and more meaningful for you. Or words of affirmation. We all like to hear, hey, good job, or hey, I really respect you, or hey, what you did, that was really admirable, or these are all things that we we all like to hear that, but some of us like to hear it more than others. Acts of service. And so that might be something like, again, with when you're sharing a household, like doing the laundry or taking the garbage out, those little mundane activities that, that we, no one wants to really do them, right? But you do them as an act of service or as a gesture of love. And then physical touch, which of course is something, again, that people have varying levels of desire in their life. You know, I'm a big hand holder and, and so is Dan. And so we like that. That's very meaningful um, to us. But not everyone enjoys that. You know, some people are like, oh, I need my space. <laughs> you know, so you really, it's really, you can't underestimate how much change and how much health you could bring to your relationship by truly understanding yourself and then, of course, your partner. And like I said earlier, Dan and I were really lucky because we were very similar. We both um, have physical touch and words of affirmation as our two top love languages. And we're, we're lucky because they're the same, so we can operate from, I can 99% of the time, if I want to receive love a certain way, then he probably wants to receive it the same way too. So we're lucky, but not all couples have that. And so the the nice thing though is, is that Dr. Chapman's model, the love language is once you understand it, then you have power to make changes in your relationship that can be really, really huge and profound. So even if you're not the same, like Dan and I are, don't worry. <laughs> Just make sure that you understand it. Take the quiz. I mean, that could be a fun little Valentine's Day thing to do between you and your partner. That's a gift right in and of itself. Like, hey, let's just sit down and figure out our love languages and make sure that we are very intentional about communicating to each other and expressing love to each other in ways that we want to receive it. Hi, I'm Vicki Zarley, and I listen to Dr. Karen, Love and Life in Palmdale, California. So, as promised, I want to bring Dan in on the conversation. So, Dan, you ready? I am. All right, great. Thanks for joining me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're talking about love languages, which um, I've already shared that we did the quiz early on in our relationship and had some fun with it. Having a guy's perspective is always excellent, I think, when we're talking about love and relationships, because you guys are half of the equation. We are. You are. And uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons I have in my book, the uh, guy talk section in every chapter to see what the the male uh, uh, vantage point is. So uh, what do you think about the love languages? I mean, we've talked about them before and we obviously, it's kind of easy for us because we're the same love language. But I'm kind of thinking of like a guy who, and again, I mean, this is why I'm asking you. I can think of this guy who like 
he's working real hard. You know, Valentine's Day is coming up and he's like doing overtime and trying to make all this extra money to buy his girlfriend this fantastic gift. And he buys her something that's like 150 bucks and that's way out of his you know budget. But he did it for her and he gives it to her. But guess what? Gifts aren't her love language. Oops. Oops. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so you can imagine the disconnect there would be that he would be like, dang, I went and I worked so hard and I scoured the mall to get the perfect gift for you. And this woman doesn't even seem like she cares that much. Maybe her love language is, uh, you know, time, quality time. Well, that's right. And if both of them didn't take it, you know, she may not even know that that's really what she values. Right. right? Because, you know, maybe she hasn't clearly self-evaluated herself. Yeah. And us guys certainly aren't very in- introspective. Yeah. So he he probably doesn't have any idea what he did wrong. Right. And, and why Valentine's Day wasn't super special. Where, when she probably maybe just wanted to, if she was into time or... Um, you know, words of affirmation that she probably just wanted to have a nice long dinner and and share their thoughts and feelings. <laughs> right, right. And think about it. I love that you use the word values because that's one of the words that, you know, I started my, my entire podcast talking about core values and that's something that is so key in relationships. And like you're saying, we're not always aware of our own values. And in this case, the love language, it reflects a value, doesn't doesn't it? Because so she's thinking, I just want your time. I just want you to take me on this long dinner and then I want words of affirmation. I just want to talk and I want you to t- tell me why I'm special and and <laughs> and and, th- and tell me that you're planning a future with me. And he has another set of values. He's like, I worked hard to earn extra money and I went to the mall and I spent, and I hate the mall, <laughs> but I went there. And the thing is, all the values, all the values that the love languages represent are great. There's not a wrong or right or good or bad. They're all wonderful, but we are missing each other. We're like ships passing if we're giving this value that we hold so dear. And then our, the recipient's like, mm, I don't really want that. Yeah, not so much. Yeah. And then looking back, you, know, you and I were very similar, fortunately, so it made it quite a bit easier. I am happy that, that your number one was not gifts. So it makes it a little bit easier on me to to, to not have to completely... Uh, over what I'm going to get you every occasion. Well, and I'm horribly hard to buy for. I mean, I am. You are, correct. <laughs> I'm very picky, darling. Dr. Karen is very picky. Yeah, well, I guess you're the beneficiary of all that, right? Because I dated for 27 years before picking you. So. <laughs> yes, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah, I am the beneficiary. There's no question about that. You're listening to Dr. Karen Anderson Abril on Love and Life. Go to our website, drkarin dot me. That's www.drkaren with a K dot me. Have any questions or would like to share your story with Dr. Karen? Email her, Karen K A R I N at drkaren dot me. Thanks so much for listening this week and for subscribing. I really appreciate it. It's been so great to connect with you via the podcast. Please let me know if you have any topics you want me to cover. I want this to be your show as much as it is mine. Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. This is Dr. Karen Anderson-Abril. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, make it a great week.